And to tell the honest truth, I have a delicacy about sitting down at all. An excursion to Diamond Head in the King's Coconut Grove was planned today, time 4.30 p.m. The party to consist of half a dozen gentlemen and three ladies. They all started at the appointed hour except myself. I was at the government prison with Captain Fish and another whale ship skipper, Captain Phillips, and got so interested in its examination that I did not notice how quickly the time was passing. Somebody remarked that it was 20 minutes past 5 o'clock, and that woke me up. It was a fortunate circumstance that Captain Phillips was along with his turnout, as he calls a top buggy that Captain Cook brought here in 1778, and a horse that was here when Captain Cook came. Captain Phillips takes a just pride in his driving and in the speed of his horse, and to his passion for displaying them. I owe it that we were only 16 minutes coming from the prison to the American Hotel, a distance which has been estimated to be over half a mile. But it took, it took some fearful driving. The captain's whip came down fast, and the blows started so much dust out of the horse's hide that during the last half of the journey we rode through an impenetrable fog and ran by a pocket compass in the hands of Captain Fish, a whaler of 26 years' experience, who sat there through the perilous voyage as self-possessed as if he had been on the Ukre deck of his own ship and calm, calmly said, Port your helm, port, from time to time, and hold her a little free. Steady, so and luff hard down to starboard and never once lost his presence of mind or betrayed the least anxiety by voice or manner when we came to anchor at last and captain phillips looked at his watch and said 16 minutes i told you it was in her that's over three miles an hour I could see he felt entitled to a compliment, and so I said, I had never seen lightning go like that horse, and I never had. The landlord of the Americans said the party had been gone nearly an hour, but that he could give me my choice of several horses that could overtake them. I said, never mind, I preferred a safe horse to a fast one. I would like to have an excessively gentle horse, a horse with no spirit what's whatever, a lame one, <laughs> if he had such a thing. Inside of five minutes I was mounted and perfectly satisfied with my outfit. I had no time to label him, this is a horse, and so if the public took him for a sheep, I cannot help it. I was satisfied, and that was the main thing. I could see that he had as many fine points as any man's horse, and so I hung my hat on one of them behind the saddle and swabbed the perspiration from my face and started. I named him after this island, Oahu, pronounced Uwahi. The first gate he came to, he started in. I had neither whip nor spur, and so I simply Daddy. argued the case with him. Daddy. Yeah. Okay? Okay. We're going to have to run because I, I got a right. green acre. Yes, indeed. He resisted argument, but ultimately yielded to insult and abuse. He backed out of that gate and steered for another one on the other side of the street. I triumphed by my former process. Within the next 600 yards, he crossed the street 14 times and attempted 13 gates. And in the meantime, the tropical sun was beating down and threatening to cave the top of my head in, and I was literally dripping with perspiration. He abandoned the gate business after that and went along peaceably enough, but absorbed in meditation. 
I noticed this later circumstance, and it soon began to fill me with apprehension. I said to myself, this creature is planning some new outrage, some fresh deviltry or other. No horse ever thought over a subject so profoundly as this one is doing just for nothing. The more this thing preyed upon my mind, the more uneasy I became, until the suspense became almost unbearable and I dismounted to see if there was anything wild in his eye. For I had heard that the eye of the noblest of our domestic animals is very expressive. I cannot describe what a load of anxiety was lifted from my mind when I found that he was only asleep. I woke him up and started him into a faster walk, and then the villainy of his nature came out again. He tried to climb over a stone wall five or six feet high. I saw that I must apply force to this horse, and that I might as well begin first as last. I plucked a stout switch from a tamarind tree, and the moment he saw it, he surrendered. Daddy, what? I'm not done with my homework because I got confused. Oh, don't. Do it. I, I can't. I got confused and I'm so confused. Okay, well, I'll be there just in a moment and help you out there. What is my stuff that you brought home? Uh, in your room, maybe? He broke into a convulsive sort of a canter, which had three short steps in it and one long one, and reminded me alternately of the clattering shake of the great earthquake and the sweeping plunging of the Ajax in a storm. And now there can be no fitter occasion than the present to pronounce a left-handed blessing upon the man who invented the American saddle. There is no set seat to speak of about it. One might as well sit in a shovel, and the stirrups are nothing but an but an ornamental nuisance. If I were to write down here all the abuse I expended on those stirrups, it would make a large book, even without pictures. Sometimes I got one foot so far through that the stirrup partook of the nature of an anklet. Sometimes both feet were through and I was handcuffed by the legs and sometimes my feet got clear out and left the stirrups wildly dangling about my shins. Even when I was in proper position and carefully balanced upon the balls of my feet, there was no comfort in it on account of my nervous dread that they were going to slip one way or the other in a moment. But the subject is too exasperating to write about. A mile and a half from town, I came to a grove of tall coconut trees with clean, branchless stems reaching straight up 60 or 70 feet and topped with a spray of green foliage, fo foliage sheltering clusters of coconuts. Not more picturesque than a forest of colossal, ragged parasols with bunches of magnified grapes under them would, would be. <laughs> I once heard a grouty northern invalid say that a coconut tree might be poetical. Possibly it was. But it looked like a feather duster struck by lightning. I think that describes it better than a picture. And yet, Without any question, there is something fascinating about a coconut tree, and graceful, too. About a dozen cottages, some frame and the others of native grass, nestled sleepily in the shade here and there. The grass cabins are of a grayish color, are shaped much like our own cottages, only with higher and steeper roofs usually, and are made of some kind of weed, strongly bound together in bundles. The roofs are very thick, 
and so are the walls. The latter have square holes in them for windows. At a little distance, these cabins have a furry appearance, as if they might be made of bear skins. They are very cool and pleasant inside. The king's flag was flying from the roof of one of the cottages, and his majesty was probably within. He owns the whole concern thereabouts, and passes his time there frequently, on sultry days, laying off. The spot is called the King's Grove. Nearby is an interesting ruin, the, Mara, the, Mag, the Magray remains of an ancient, the, <laughs> the meager remains of an ancient heathen temple, a place where human sacrifices were offered up in those old bygone days when the simple child of nature Yielding momentarily to sin when sorely tempted, acknowledged his error when calm reflection had shown it to him, and came forward with noble frankness, and offered up his grandmother as an atoning sacrifice. In those old days when the luckless sinner could keep on cleansing his conscious, conscience, and achieving periodical happiness as long as his relations held out. Long, long before the missionaries braved a thousand privations to come <laughs> and make them permanently miserable by telling them how beautiful and how blissful a place heaven is and how nearly impossible it is to get there and show the poor native how dreary a place tradition is, and what unnecessarily liberal f facilities there are for going to it, showed him about how in his ignorance he had gone and fooled away all his kinfolks to no purpose, showed him what rapture it is to work all day long for 50 cents to buy food for next day with as compared with fishing for pastime and lolling in the shade through eternal summer and eating of the bounty that nobody labored to provide but nature. How sad it is to think of the multitudes who have gone to their graves in this beautiful island and never knew there was a hell. This ancient temple was built of rough blocks of lava, and it was simply a roofless enclosure 130 feet long and 70 wide nothing but naked walls, very thick, but not much higher than a man's head. They will last for ages, no doubt, if left unmolested. Its three altars and other sacred apparatuses have crumbled and passed away years ago. Uh, in just a moment, I want to finish this chapter, and then I'll be there to help you with your homework. It is said that in the old times, thousands of human beings were slaughtered here. In the presence of naked and howling savages. If these mute stones could speak, what tales they could tell, what pictures they could describe, of fettered victims writhing under the knife, of masked forms straining forward out of the gloom with ferocious